niche brands generally and Volvo specifically, where do they fit in and should you consider buying one? That's next. I'm John Cadogan from autoexpert.com.au and I get new cars cheap for buyers here in Australia. You can inquire at the website about that. Now, I've got this question from a dude named Dennis, and we'll get to that in just a second. And there's a bit to unpack, and I didn't want to write, you know, war and peace by email to one guy when I could do this and give him a better answer face-to-face, albeit once removed, and also perhaps help you on this journey towards new car acquisition. So let's get right into it. Dennis says... I am a Vietnam veteran with a gold card. And to that, I would respond, thank you sincerely for your service to the nation. And I would extend that to all servicemen who've returned and are currently in service and also first responders, because there's a salient difference, isn't there, between those dudes and the rest of us. And that is, we run (laughs) that way when there's danger and these dudes go that way. And that's worthy of some respect. In a sense, They write a cheque, don't they, that's cashable at any time, up to and including the value of their own lives. And if we don't respect that, then who are we as a society? So thank you, Dennis. And I imagine you pay for that service every day and you have for the the succeeding 50 years or something. So it's significant, at least to me. Dennis goes, I currently own two vehicles, a BMW 320M Sport and a 2007 Nissan Navara D40 4x4 with 87,000 Ks on the clock, which he's going to consider trading if the price is right, he says. And and to that, I would say that, you know, trade-ins are all about convenience. They're about the convenience of disposal of your old shitbox, okay? If you want the price to be right, if you're after the maximum return for a vehicle that you are going to punt out the door, then you've got to sell it privately. And that could be problematic, couldn't it, in the current environment of social distancing and not knowing whom you are inviting to your house and what they might be carrying. So there's that. Dennis says, uh, but I would keep the ute for beach work and teaching the grandkids how to drive, which sounds completely rational to me. He goes, I'm not in a rush. I've just had shoulder surgery, so get well soon, Dennis. I hope that goes as well as can be expected in the circumstances. And uh, then he says, I've watched many of your informative reviews. Yes. And I think we share similar views on life. And to that, I'd say, well, I'm terribly sorry to hear that. You can probably get help for that and um, nobody deserves it. Anyway, I have not seen a review on the hybrid Volvos. Now, this is a point of confusion for me because Dennis is uh, after a Volvo XC40, but he can't decide between that and a new Santa Fe Highlander or Elite and also the upcoming Kia Sorento. And on this point of hybrid Volvos, I'd go, huh? Because... XC40, last time I looked, was an internal combustion-only powertrain job, certainly when I checked this morning on Volvo's website to see that they hadn't just slipped in a hybrid under the radar. Apparently, they haven't. It's a two-litre turbocharged four-cylinder internal combustion engine with eight-speed automatic. It's in two different states of tune. If you buy the premium version of XC40, the R, whatever, then the uh, you get a, a, the higher state of tune. The R design, auto, all-wheel drive, model year 20, you get whatever it is here. Let's just check. The engine is uh, 185 kilowatts at 5,500 RPM and 350 newton metres of torque from 1,800 to 4,800. So respectable output, certainly, but it's also a premium price. We'll get into all of that as well, but we'll finish Dennis's question, shall we? Uh, Dennis goes, I have a head-up display on my BMW and I'm hooked on that, but don't find it available on many new SUVs. So I'd suggest that Hyundai Kia tend to have head-up display on their SUVs in the Highlander models. I've just been driving a Kona EV, which is essentially the electric Kona Highlander. It's got head-up display. I own a Santa Fe Highlander. It's got head-up display. It's a 19, uh, 19, it's a 2019 car. And I've just crawled all over the left hook version of Hyundai Palisade in Highlander trim, uh, essentially, and 
it's got a head-up display as well. So I think it's fair to say that Hyundai Motor Group's uh, default proposition with head-up display in SUVs is that the top-spec versions have head-up display and you get speed indication, turn-by-turn nav directions. It's quite good on a long trip because you don't obviously have to go down there and focus on the speedo and take your eyes completely off the road every time you want to check your speed. So I'm a fan of head-up display as well, although it's not like head-up display on a fighter jet. It's kind of vestigially useful, but you can live without it. So uh, Dennis has asked me for a comment on that. Hopefully that will suffice. And he goes, I realise I've hit you with a huge task, but I am in a quandary as to which way to head, and I'd be very obliged and grateful for any advice you can offer. Okay, so here's the thing where I kind of have to get the sword out but I want to do it gently, okay? Because I understand that there's all kinds of people out there buying all kinds of cars. And I want to tell you the kind of person I generally target when I talk about what car to buy, all right? I'm talking to a mainstream car buyer, and that would be a person who buys a car because they're not an enthusiast per se, right? They're not specifically enthusiastic about Jaguar or Land Rover or Volvo or Skoda or Volkswagen. They just want a good value car that's packed with features, is going to be reliable, unlikely to let them down, And if it does, they're going to get a high level of customer support. I mean, is that too much to ask for? Because we're spending 40, 50, 60, 70 thousand dollars here. And I'd suggest it's entirely reasonable to want those things. But I don't want to sink the slipper too hard into people who have these nut job enthusiastic prerequisites, okay? And I say nut job in the nicest possible way because it is entirely fine to have nutty, irrational enthusiasms in life, you know? And if you think you want a Volvo, then what I'd ask you to do is categorise yourself. Are you some sort of scando freak who furnishes his house with Ikea and only dates, you know, statuesque Viking shield maidens or something and watches Thor a thousand times because, hey, that's where the story comes from and all of these things, okay? If you... And only eat meatballs, let's not forget, right? So if you're that dude and you are specifically uh, Scandinavian, enthusiastic, driven to buy a car, then, hey, buy a Volvo. That's fine. I get it. It's irrational, and this may come at a cost, but if that is you, you are probably going to be able to bear that cost emotionally. Not so much if you're just a mainstream car buyer and you erroneously believe that Volvo, for example, is Scando Mercedes-Benz, because I would suggest... That's not the case, specifically not here in Australia. And I'd include a whole bunch of other brands like that too, right? Because there's a whole bunch of other brands that you might be skewed towards. If you are a Francophile, you might want a Citron or a you know, Peugeot or something, but those brands are nowhere in Australia and buying one is a mistake. And Volvo's in this category as well, okay? So let me define what I mean by that. I'd suggest that if you're a mainstream car buyer, you should not buy a brand that fails to sell an absolute minimum of 10,000 units annually in this country. Because if you do, you open yourself up to the following suite of problems, right? There's going to be a limited number of dealers and that That's just commercial reality, right? So that means there are limited opportunities for you to go out and shop not only for the car and get a discount, but also for things like parts and servicing. This is a huge problem. And then further up the logistic train of supply, right, what we've got here is limited spare parts availability onshore. That's a problem because if you're driving down the road and some drunk dickhead has a minor fender bender with you and you need half a dozen panel pieces and whatever to get your car back on the road, it's nice if they're in stock and can be supplied because you don't have to wait four months to get them from wherever, Sweden, Belgium, whatever. The uh, XC40 is made in Belgium. So anyway, they've got to be shipped from somewhere like that, which is a bit of a problem at the best of times and I think you'd agree 2020 is not the best of times, particularly when it comes to global shipping, right? All transport logistics are maxed out and there are extensive weights for everything. So there's that. So when you look at Volvo, 
there's those kinds of problems and in the dealership even, right, they're thinking about most dealerships are multi-franchised and what this means is they've got half a dozen different brands and they have to allocate their resources internally according to which brands make them more or less profit, all right? So how much do you reckon they're going to invest in technical training for Volvo? Not as much as Toyota. That's the bottom line, right? So if you've got a problem and it's hard to diagnose, it's going to be hard to find a guy who is really familiar with those kinds of problems because there's not that many vehicles out there in service exhibiting those problems for solution and there's not that much internal investment in resources like training and specialised diagnostic equipment. There's just not. So you're up against all of these problems. And I'd further suggest that brands like Volvo are dog brands here in Australia. Now, if you're not from Australia and you're watching from Europe or North America or something, I admit that lately Volvo has really taken some positive steps forward in terms of sales and quality and things like that. But here in Australia, not so much. And I did some research on volumes and let's talk about the brands that I would describe as being not worthy of consideration if you are just a mainstream car buyer. You've got Volvo selling about 7,000 units this year. You've got Skoda on about 7,000 as well. You've got Land Rover on about 9,000. You've got Jaguar 2000 Jeep on about 5,000. They're going nowhere. In some cases, they're going backwards. And Volvo, Jeep, Jaguar, Land Rover, they've had ample opportunity, haven't they, to really kick a goal and develop a critical mass kind of thing. Now, Jaguar and Land Rover are not... British Mercedes-Benz, Skoda is not, Czechoslovakian, Czech Republic, Audi or something, it's just not. And Jeep is certainly, you know, it's the ultimate dog brand when I think about it. The uh, There are some brands that are less than 10,000 units, okay? You've got LDV and Ram. LDV's on 6,500 sales annually and Ram's on about 2.9K at the moment. And they've both got substantial growth potential because they're new entrants and they're developing momentum. So if I was some sort of market watch stockbroker dude, I'd be saying these are a couple to watch because they might achieve critical mass and then they might be worthy of your consideration. There's some that are really not though, like absolutely not. If Volvo is here and the rest of the market for mainstream is up here, there are certainly brands way down here and they include Sanyong, which has had multiple cracks at Australia and still failed to kick a goal. They're selling about a thousand units, all right, in the latest iteration of Sanyong Australia. You've got Havel, 1.7k. Great Wall, 1.4. Now that is just unacceptable. 1.4 for Great Wall. They've been here for donkey's years in one form or another and they are just not kicking a goal over and over and over. Unacceptable. You've got Fiat, which is falling off a cliff with the rest of Fiat Chrysler. It's selling about a thousand units. That's not including the light commercials. You've got Chrysler on just 300. Like that's so unsustainable, it's not funny. You've got Alfa Romeo, less than a thousand. You've got Citroen on 400 units, and you've got Persia, which has been here for donkey's years as well, selling about 2,400 units. So, unless you're a dead set Francophile or there's a reason that your enthusiasm directs you specifically to one of these brands, buy mainstream because you will likely get much better support. The final thing about Volvo that I feel compelled to point out, and I want to do this gently, I don't want to do it like, you know, let's get the gloves on and jump in the ring or something, but I feel obliged to point out the history of Volvo, the recent sort of 20-year history of Volvo. And I say this as somebody with deep respect for Volvo and its technical prowess at safety after, particularly in 2010, I flew to Sweden and went to Volvo's head office to do a mini documentary for Channel 7 News and Current Affairs about the way we botch child safety in cars for our youngest children, specifically by turning them round and facing them forward too early. And I interviewed Volvo's leading technical expert on this stuff, Dr. Lotta Jacobson, and she was like one of the most impressive technical experts I have ever interviewed, totally squared away in her specialist niche, okay? So it's not like I've got an axe to grind with Volvo. It's 
really that I'm sort of biased towards quality cars for you. So let's not forget that after years and years, like 70 years or something, of Swedish ownership in-house of Volvo, Ford acquired Volvo in 1999, I think, and they owned Volvo for 11 years. The pesky global financial crisis intervened. That would be the one that completely upended General Motors and Chrysler, and they both went into Chapter 11 insolvency in the United States. And Ford narrowly ran around this problem by having a fire sale. And specifically, what they did was they sold their premier automotive group, Jaguar, Land Rover, Volvo and Aston Martin, okay? So they sold Jaguar and Land Rover to the Indians, to Tata Automotive, that huge industrial conglomerate really, and then they sold Aston Martin to a group of Middle Eastern investors, like an investment consortium, and after much trying with an initial price of six billion US dollars, they sold Volvo to the Chinese, to Geely, okay? And they sold it for 1.5 billion. So talk about ultimate discount price, 75% off. Yes. It's just a disaster, okay? And the Chinese, I think they're principal motivation for purchasing Volvo was to procure the intellectual property. Because if you're already a fledgling global player, like Geely is in automotive this and that, then why not buy Volvo for a huge discount, own the intellectual property, proliferate it through the rest of your range, and then sort of see what you can do with Volvo on the side. And they haven't done such a bad job with that. But it's not the primary game for an industrial conglomerate like Geely. And Volvo is still not Swedish Mercedes-Benz, even though I get the feeling they're trying very hard. In Australia, they're not achieving very hard at all. In fact, you know, there's a whole lot of cultural inertia in Australia. You've got the same company essentially selling Volvos at a wholesale level and you've got essentially the same dealer network as under the Ford regime, retailing them to customers. And these groups broadly are not the pinnacle of customer service. They're the exact opposite of that because, hey, that's how they've rolled for 20 years or something and it's very hard to turn this ship around. And they're just not achieving commercially any sort of benchmarks that you could say were in line with the way the rest of the world is going with Volvo in North America and Europe. They're going much better. Anyway. So you've got a culture that fails to support customers, at least in the context of below average, being below average, and you've got products that are just not supported because they can't be because the operation is not at critical mass. And I'd suggest that's a bad look, okay? So if you're looking for a car to be problem-free, then this probably isn't that. And then I want to talk to you finally about value. So we're looking at new Santa Fe, new Sorrento, and I don't have the actual spec data on that yet because at the time I'm recording this video, these vehicles are not fully released, pricing is not announced, etc. Okay, but let's compare the R spec, the R design T5 XC40 with a Santa Fe Highlander, the current Santa Fe Highlander. And this is not an apples for apples comparison, obviously, because XC40 is slightly smaller. It's only a five-seater, but, you know, if you want it to be a four-wheel drive wagon that carries the grandkids and can take you camping or, you know, to safe sort of mild camping sites that don't involve actual four-wheel driving, it'll do that. That's fine. You know, so will Santa Fe, okay? They're the same philosophical kind of thing, although Santa Fe is a seven-seater. But when you look at the price guide, which I've got up here from Redbook, okay, it's like 56990 for the R-Design um, XC40, all right? But this is not an apples for apples comparison with Santa Fe yet, but we can make it so, okay? But to do that, we've got to add a thing called the Comfort Pack, which is a heated steering wheel and heated front seats, okay, and heated rear seats as well all of which are standard in Santa Fe Highlander. That's 900 bucks. And we've then got to add the lifestyle pack, which is premium sound system and privacy glass and a sunroof, all of which are standard on Santa Fe Highlander. That's $3,000 extra on the Volvo for that. Then we've got to add the 360 degree sort of surround view, you know, bird's eye view camera, 
because that's standard on Santa Fe, but it's a $990 option on the Volvo. And then we've got to have the Park Assist Pilot, which is the automated steering for backing into a parking spot. That's 650 bucks extra on the Volvo and standard on Santa Fe. So when we add all of that and I look at the driveway price in New South Wales, this is the recommended undiscounted driveway price for that fully loaded top spec Volvo. It's $69,000. And when I look at Santa Fe Highlander, driveway in New South Wales, undiscounted recommended price, it's like $66,600 drive away. So you get two extra seats, you got more mid-range torque because the diesel engine just produces more mid-range torque. More mid-range torque means more mid-range power, means better acceleration without revving its tits off. So there's that. And I'd suggest if you landed here from Alpha Centauri and you looked at those two cars side by side, particularly the standard uh, XC40 T5R design thing without those options, you would be forced to conclude that the Santa Fe was the premium product because it's just got more features. That's just how it is. And I'd suggest that there's a much better support network and support culture at Hyundai versus Volvo, okay? There's not going to be the Euro design exclusivity sort of cachet. People aren't going to look at you in the Santa Fe as they would in the Volvo and go, that, that's different. I haven't seen one of those before. And they are very likely to say that with the XC40. But I'd suggest you really need to pass P-A-R-S-E, pass these things through the filter of mainstream use and look at it more like uh, a rational undertaking and less like an emotionally driven Euro cachet type undertaking if all you want is transport that's not going to let you down, that's reasonably good value and you're going to get good support if something goes wrong. So that's how I look at these sort of tier two and tier three European car manufacturers in particular like Skoda, Land Rover, Jaguar, Volvo, none of them are at critical mass. And the only justification I can see for buying one is if you are that nutty enthusiast who's really driven to that kind of car because of some other kind of irrational hierarchy in your life. If you're a mainstream car buyer, buy a mainstream car because it's just a risk mitigation strategy. 